a cool uh, research project that we've had the opportunity to work with uh, for DARPA over the last three years called SAFE. We're basically, we're basically trying to redesign the computer for uh, greater security. Um, so really what we're, what we're going after is trying to answer the question, what can we do if, we, if we're starting from a clean slate? If, what can we do if we're not constrained by um, using x86, using JVM, using C? What if we can kind of get out of the box and, and do something different? Can we improve the state of security in computers today? So really, really SAFE is a, a co-design of, of several very large components. We're building a new applications programming language called Breeze. We're building a low-level systems programming language called Tempest. And then we're also developing a new operating system. And we're, de and we're building new hardware. We're designing a new processor to run, to run all of this stuff. Um, but, but the mantra is, is really defense in depth. We, we have security mechanisms in place at every level in the, st in the stack, especially, especially at hardware. We're, we're um, emphasizing hardware enforced security. And the reason we're doing that is, is we feel that dynamic security checking is just, is just going to be too expensive in software. It's going to take too much of an overhead, especially, especially if you're considering doing uh, fine-grained inf information flow control, which, which we're targeting in this program. But the, the other benefit of hardware enforced security is it provides, uh, it gives you the most general attack model. I mean, theoretically, you should be able to handle things from high-level scripting attacks all the way down to more sophisticated um, machine injection attacks, return-oriented programming attacks, that sort of thing. So this is, this is kind of a high-level overview of what the, the hardware looks like. Um, every, every word of data in the system, we call a word an atom, but every word uh, contains three fields. We have a payload, a 64-bit payload, we have a 5-bit uh, atomic group, and then we have a 59-bit uh, tag. The payload is just the data, the data is that's getting computed. It could be integers, it could be instructions, it could be pointers, whatever. Uh, the group, the atomic group, is basically uh, identifying what type uh, the data is. Is the data an integer? Is it an instruction? Is it a frame pointer, a stream pointer? Is it undefined? And then finally, the, the tag, the tag is basically a memory uh, pointer that, that points off into memory, and it points to what we call metadata, and this is the data that uh, essentially defines the, um, what, what you can do with this particular piece of data. And we, we call these things label models. So we, you can have a label model for secrecy, for example, or you can have another label model that governs uh, integrity of the program. Uh, you, can, you can use a label model for typing, uh, so for doing runtime uh, type checks. That, that's, that's also possible. And, and more recently, we're looking at ways to do, uh, create label models for even uh, control flow integrity to prevent um, you know, return-oriented programming, jump-oriented program, the, the sorts of, those sorts of attacks that um, uh, corrupt the control flow of a program. In terms of the architecture, it's very, it's very risk-based. So there's, we have a conventional register file, it's 32 elements deep. Uh, we access uh, memory through load and store instructions. But the key takeaway here is every, every piece of data, uh, whether it's in the register file or whether it's sitting out in memory, is an atom, so you're going to have the payload tag and then atomic group uh, associated with that piece of data. Um, regarding the executional units on the on the chip, uh, we have a, a fairly conventional ALU, but in parallel to the ALU processing, we're doing um, group processing, tag processing, and, and pointer processing. So we have a unit, an atomic group unit. So this pulls off the atomic groups of all the pieces of data associated with this instruction and determines whether or not that, that instruction is allowed to execute or not. Uh, pointers in the system are a little bit different. Uh, pointers are not just arbitrary addresses into memory, but they're really an address plus uh, encoded into that pointer is a bounds, um, basically a range of memory that that pointer has, has access to. And so the, the, we, we can call these fat pointers. So the fat pointer unit basically governs whether or not your pointer operations are, are safe. Uh, it, will, it will trap you if you are trying to exceed a range of a, of a buffer, for instance. Um, but the real, the real magic happens in what we call the tag management unit, uh, or TMU. So what the TMU does is it, it pulls off all of these tags for all of the pieces of data on a particular instruction. So it grabs the tags from the operands, grabs the tag from the instruction. Uh, we, have, we carry along a PC, uh, which helps us track implicit flows in the system. We grab the tag from the PC. And all of this goes into the TMU, 
And a TMU basically acts like a database. So it looks up to see if this particular operation is allowed or not. And furthermore, if it is allowed, it, it computes the tags for all the results. So these tags then get appended onto all of the, all of the results. And then if all of this stuff checks out, then that, that instruction is committed and um, the state is saved and then the machine goes on to the next step. So when we started this project, we're, we're basically starting with an outline of an ISA, but really not much else. Um, I believe the, the project uh, was, took a baseline from the Tierra project, which I, I believe was an, an Air Force Research Labs project run by um, Howie Schroeb, Andre DeHaan, and Thomas Knight. But they, they basically formed the baseline. They gave us, they gave us a really good uh, architecture for the hardware just to start with, and that's, that's where SAFE took off. But we really had, I mean, we had no languages, we had no compilers, uh, very little tool chain, uh, no working hardware at this point. So how did, how, did we, how did we proceed? Well, the first thing we did was we started to sketch out an assembly language. Uh, we started building up a, a simple instruction set simulator and started writing very simple assembly programs and testing those programs with our, with our simulator. At the same time, uh, the hardware engineers, the hardware researchers at UPenn started coding up the processor in blue spec and started working with the FPGA development boards we were targeting on the project. And then the programming language researchers at UPenn, Harvard, Northeastern, they started designing this, this new applications langu language that we, we call Breeze. And the, the plan for Breeze was basically to, to basically steal um, Andrew Meyer's work on GIF and, and port it into this, this new language. And so most, starting off, we thought most of the interesting work had been done, and so Breeze is probably going to take a couple months of work, and we'll be able to move on to other things. Didn't account for Hofstetter's law of programming language research by any, any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so this is, this is what safe assembly looks like. Um, I hope you can all read that. <laughs> it's assembly, you're not supposed to read it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's about as much fun as programming x86, uh, or PowerPC for that matter. But unlike those, unlike those systems, we have to manage things for security. So we have to segment our program into a collection of frames. So these frames basically give us um, the bounds for various pointer operations. Uh, we've got to tag not, I shouldn't say tag, we have to label atomic group information on various pieces of data. So uh, we've got some stuff down here. These are instruction pointers. These are gate pointers. We've got some uninitialized data. This is an integer, for example. Um, and then we have to apply tags on data. So we have to um, basically say here, okay, this region of code here is going to be tagged with user private. Uh, this region here is going to be tagged with bootloader private, uh, and so on and so forth. And then one thing we didn't, I didn't show you in the previous slide, but this architecture also supports secure closures. So a closure is an environment and a, a function. Well, a secure closure, which we call a gate, is an environment, a function, and then an authority that function can execute under. Execute under. And so you have to ask the question, how long, how long can we, we stay productive in this environment? And I, I think the answer is pretty clear, not very long. So, about year one, we decide, you know, this assembly is tedious. We really need to, we need some, some tooling behind this. So the first thing we want to grasp is, is macros. We need, we need some sort of macros to help us do, do, do a lot of these tedious tasks. At the same time, the, the Breeze compiler, or I should say the Breeze interpreter was up and running, and so we're starting to build up more Breeze code. We have a, a small standard library starting to get off the ground. And so there's this pressure to get a compiler in place such that we can do two things. We can start ex, um, exercising the, the hardware more. But um, the second reason we have our OS guys, they're waiting for some higher level languages so they can start building up some of the operating system components on this, on this platform. So a solution, a partial solution to both of these problems is, okay, let's take the assembly language, let's turn it into a DSL, and let's embed it in Haskell. Okay, so now you've got a very nice macro language, hence Haskell, to do all the little tedious things that are, are painful in concrete syntax. But the, Another nice thing is, okay, if this, if this assembly language is uh, embedded in Haskell, well, that can just simply become a library for the future Breeze compiler. Uh, the, the Breeze compiler's code generator can call that library and, and um, make a lot of use of it. Okay, so Breeze, in terms of the language research, um, versions are just churning out on Breeze now. Uh, very early on, we had this, this period of time where we spent like four or five weeks just trying to figure out how to do Boolean operations within the context of information flow control. So, this, this should have been a warning flag. This, uh, this IFC stuff is not very easy from a, a language perspective. 
we also we also had um, early on we had difficult difficulties with access control. So um, the initial the initial versions of Breeze were were using this this method of access call we, we called lexical authority passing or basically a one principle per, per, per software module. And the, the intent was this should make it easy to modularize our programs. It should make it um, so we can make fairly, fairly well compartmentalized programs easily. But in reality, it turned out uh, this was it basically was the opposite. The opposite was true. It made it, made it much, much harder to write, write um, clear and concise programs with IFC in this, in this type of framework. Here's just a quick screenshot of what Haskell looks like in, or I should say what assembly looks like in Haskell. Um, the nice thing though is we can, I mean, we're doing the obvious things. We're, we're, we have a couple of monads to capture program descriptions. Um, we now have the ability to write little macros to handle a lot of the tedious, tedious cases that were, were painful in the concrete syntax. Um, but not just macros for setting up data, we can, we can write macros for control flow as well. So you want a while loop, here's, here's a function that you can do for for while loops or, or if else conditionals. So at about year one and a half, um, the, the ADSL was, it helped us. I mean, we were able to get these simple macros, but at the end of the day, we're still dealing with assembly language. So we're still wrestling with um, uh, having to manage your, all your registers by hand, having to manage your calling conventions by hand. Uh, if you want elaborate data structures, you have to still build those up by hand in assembly. So uh, we we're still struggling there. Uh, about the same time, the, the Breeze compiler just starts to come off the ground. We got something just barely running. Um, but the problem was, if you looked at the compiler flow of, of Breeze, it was, it was kind of kludgy. We made this really large jump towards the back end. The front end was very, very conventional. I mean, a lot of desugaring up front. Um, Breeze has a very, very rich, very, very nice contract language. And so a lot of the contracts were compiled up front. And then we went through CPS, enclosure conversion. But when we got to closure conversion, we made this huge leap to assembly code. And so there's this big gap in the tool flow, no optimization. So the, the programs that you would get out of very, very trivial Breeze programs uh, were just enormous and, and really unusable at this point. On the plus side, um, at the back end, the, the EDSL we created for the assembly plugged in seamlessly with the, with the Breeze code generator. So that, was, that, was, that, that turned out to be nice. Um, Breeze is starting, is continuing to turn on, on revisions. Um, we're starting to ask questions, okay, what, what do we want to do when we have an access violation? And early on we said, well, just, it's simple, we're just going to kill the machine. If, if you try and read data you can't read, we're just going to stop the machine and, 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 and kill the thread. Well, what if, what if we have somebody, uh, a malicious at attacker inside the system that intentionally classifies a piece of data and sends it to a server or sends it to you? And, uh, knowing that it's going to kill the, kill the machine. I mean, that becomes a denial of service attack. So what do we do if, if somebody's maliciously sending data? Well, the answer was simple. What we'll do is we'll just read the label on that data, and if we can access the data, we'll continue. If we can't, we'll throw it away and continue on. But then, then the problem is, well, what if, what if the label itself is classified? Um, so this, is, this was like the big aha, oh shoot moment in the project. And, this later became known as what we call the poison pill in IFC. Okay, about year point uh, 2.0, um, Breeze compiler goes through a major overhaul. We redo a lot of the front end. We do a lot of work in the middle end, but still, um, it's still not going to come to the aid of the, the OS guys. We just it's, it's just not working to the to the point that we expected at this point in the project. So. At this point, we really need a higher, low-level language. We need something definitely above the assembly that we have uh, working today. Breeze. At this point, uh, it's just every week a new, a new major version of Breeze is coming out. Um, so we have a solution to poison pills. And the solution to this poison pill problem was kind of counterintuitive, but they went with the idea of using public labels. So every time you label a piece of data, that label is public information. Um, but the trick here, the trick here uh, was you have to specify the label in advance of, of, of labeling data. So before you, um, before you label a piece of data, you have to specify the label and um, you can't look at any of the secrets on that data or you can't compute any of that data. So everything has to be done up front. And so this, this solved the poison pill problem, but it broke, uh, it broke our access control problem of, of uh, lexical authority passing. Uh, so this, this became known in the project as the lexical authority containment problem. So we switched to another, another method of access control, which we call dynamic 
dynamic authority. Okay, so year, year two and a half um, goes by and Tempest, Tempest gets started. So Tempest is, is becoming the, the systems programming for the SAFE, the SAFE platform. So, so Tempest is an imperative language. Uh, it has automatic register allocation, which is great. Uh, it's got optimizations. Um, the other thing it has is it has very nice control over uh, inline assembly. Not only inline assembly, but we also have user-specified calling conventions too. Um, not surprisingly, Tempest uses the SAFE EDSL as a backend. So that was able to bolt into the Tempest framework relatively easily. Uh, but Tempest is also nice because it fills, or hopefully it will fill this, this, this IR gap that we have in the Breeze compiler. Um, so we're, we're, we're encouraged that this will get Breeze, uh, Breeze compilation running up, up, up and running relatively soon. Uh, Breeze um, comes up with these, these clever things called NAVs for delayed, insect, uh, delayed exceptions. So this is, um, the PL guys really struggled with um, trying to figure out how to do uh, exception handling within the context of IFC. Um, the two don't play together very well at all and they spent a lot of time wrestling with that and they came up with this notion of NAVs. Um, quick screenshot of what Tempest looks like when it's embedded in Haskell. Um, one, one cool thing though is when you're doing Pilar's backend, we'll be using um, the Tempest DDSL as, as the code generator. Uh, the Tempest, um, temp, the Tempest EDSL uh, leverages the safe EDSL in two places. It uses it for assembly inlining, and it also uses it for um, uh, code generation. So the Tempest compiler uses the safe EDSL we already created for, um, for code gen. And then the safe EDSL flows through our safe assembler, which produces the various uh, memory images. Um, the processor is, is, is fairly unique. So we have you know, a memory image for main memory, but we also have a lot of images for our TMU. Uh, the TMU is a fairly elaborate piece of hardware. It's, uh, it looks like a, a, a fairly exotic cam slash cache, cache structure. So there's all sorts of clever stuff going on in the TMU. Um, but once we, once we have a program, we can then send that through our debugger and, that, and then target to either running these programs on our safe uh, instruction set simulator. We can throw it over the wall to um, the hardware simulator in blue spec, or we, can, or we can run it on the hardware itself. Uh, one, I think one of the nice parts of the project is every, everything you see here in green is Haskell. So everything is, has been built up in, with Cabal, and so we have these libraries that we can, we can easily share and, and bolt together. Okay, so some of, the, some of the lessons learned. I mean, the first, I think, was designing uh, an IFC language is, is very difficult. Um, it's, it's one thing to design a, a language that's secure, but it's, it's something else to design a language that's both secure higher order and, and, and usable, uh, usable by the, the common programmer. And on, on this project we had, um, we had the opportunity to work with like 10 to 15 of some of the most brilliant programming language researchers in the world. And so I, I guess my only, my only suggestion is try and keep that number. If you go do something like we're doing, keep it between <laughs> two and seven. <laughs> um, a little friction every now and then, but that's, that's good. Um, no, it was it was fun. Um, it was it was it was a really unique experience for me. I, we'd have these weekly telecons, and you have like you you have Benjamin Pierce on the line talking with Greg Morissette and Olin Scherer's and all their crazy brilliant grad students, and just to hear them over the course of two years wrestle with these these very complicated pro um, problems in in informa information flow control. Um, uh, very very interesting conversations occasionally. Um, I should, I, this is my opinion. I, I, don't, I can't really speak for the rest of the project, but in my opinion, on day, on day when we should have started with uh, Tempest instead of assembly. It's not, I mean, obviously, you can never get really good productivity coding in assembly. Um, but especially for this project, um, where, you're, where you're trying to design the hardware at the same time, you're trying to design the runtime, Tempest is, a, I think, a good level. Uh, you still have good control over the assembly code, but you also have a layer of insulation between the, the operating system components you're writing and the, the, the hardware, which itself is going through changes. So it helps minimize some of the ripples that that produces. 
EDSLs are great for bootstrapping a new language. So Tempest, Tempest started off as an EDSL, and we're very quickly able to get that up and running and get people programming that. So we have, I mean, a number of components are being built right now in the EDSL that we have in Tempest. Uh, but they also, they also make back -end, back, a great backend library, so they're very easy to bolt together in, in compilers. There, there's, there's problems uh, with EDSLs. I mean, first off, it, it requires that your engineers are comfortable with the host language. And so this, this, is, this is kind of tricky for us. Uh, not everybody on our team was, was comfortable with or familiar with Haskell when we started, but slowly, you know, over a course of, of several months, that, that, that improved. Um, EDSLs are harder to, to debug. You don't, it's tough to get, you know, line number and column number error messages out of EDSLs. Uh, if anybody has a solution to this, we, we, we would like to hear about it because this is something that we do struggle with even today. Uh, there, there's still good reasons to go to concrete syntax. So if you're designing a language, obviously um, there, there still are reasons to go to concrete. Uh, but I think it's more relevant for some languages versus others. So Tempest is, is probably a language where you do want to have that in concrete um, eventually. Whereas safe assembly, uh, theoretically you're not going to have a lot of people programming in assembly. So there's probably less motivation to do, to move to concrete syntax for assembly. Um, there's also a question of when is, when is the best transition point? When do you want to move from an EDSL into, into concrete syntax? And Alexi, our, our compiler guru, had, had, had thoughts on this. He, I mean, he said that early, very early in a project, you, you, you're going to have pressure from the developers to have modularity. They want to be able to split things in multiple files. And in EDSL, you can, you, you can basically leverage the host system's mod, uh, module system for that. And so once, once the language you're, you're building up has a module system, that might, be, that might be a good time to transition, but you probably, you probably don't want to move over until that's in place. We also could have benefited from probably a DSL at the hardware as well. So it would have been really nice starting the project if we had a DSL that described the semantics of the instructions uh, at the beginning. Because theoretically, we, we would have been able to generate not all of the blue spec, but a quite a good deal of blue spec from from such a description automatically. We could have gotten an instruction, simula uh, instruction set simulator practically for free. Um, we could have you know, generated pieces of the assembler and the safe EDSL. Um, we're doing a lot of verification in Coq, so this could have produced uh, artifacts for Coq as well. Um, and, just, and then just general documentation too. It would be nice to have just automatically generate your ISA documentation uh, from, this, from that. So real quick, final plugs. Um, this, is, this has been a huge project spanning you know, everything from high level applications down to bare metal implementations. And so there's, there's a volume of really great, interesting papers uh, that this, this, this team has produced. So I definitely encourage you to, to check that out on your website. And, and more specifically, if you're, if you're gonna be attending ICFP this week, uh, Katzlin and friends are, I think they're, they're showing their, their paper on uh, entitled Testing Non-Interference Quickly. I believe that's on Friday. But anyways, they, what, they're, what they've done is they've basically made a real cool use of quick check for verifying, or I shouldn't say verifying, but testing, testing um, security properties of different architectures. So basically, they'll, what they'll give quick check is a description of, of a machine, its instruction set semantics, and then quick check attempts to generate programs that violate uh, non-interference properties. Really, really cool use of quick check. And then finally, uh, we're hiring. So we're looking for compiler engineers. So if this IFC stuff is interesting to you, if you like to target new, new novel hardware, um, we're looking for guys to help us compile Breeze and Tempest. And then just real quick, um, these are all the folks that have been on Crash in, in some form or another. I, hopefully I got everybody on, on, that name, on that list. And then just a special thanks to Howie at DARPA. He's been, he's been a great supporter for us uh, over the last uh, few years. So we've really appreciated his, his support. So thank you. Uh, the question was, have we considered Racket uh, for, for our language? And, well, actually, Racket, I believe, is one of, the, um, one of the inspirations for Breeze. So if you look at Breeze, uh, Breeze has a very rich contract language, which I believe was taken uh, from Racket. And that's, been, um, that's a whole 
subtopic within this whole project. Um, but that's yeah, I believe we didn't we didn't we didn't take Racket per se, but we I, we we stole a lot of ideas from Racket. Yeah, the, the PL guys are spending most of their time. I mean, they spend a lot of time in COC trying to verify semantics of, of various various things. Uh, the, the quick check is one one example. So we're using quick check to basically weed out all the bad cases, and once that gets through quick check, then it then it gets thrown over the wall to COC. And so they they spend a lot of time on, on some of the very least simple COC models, and so but it's it's not just that, but a lot of a lot of formal verification of high level breeze. Um, um, uh, construct. So, kind of the debate between lexical authority passing and dynamic. Uh, a lot of that's been has been verified out, verified out in, in Coq. Uh, 